So I'm in my shop right now. You can see my lathe over my shoulder. And I wanted to show you a few things. Um, this is a stubby 750 lathe. And it's a little different than most lathes that, um, that we, we see. Um, it, it looks pretty short. Um, it's got, you know, sort of the normal headstock, tail stocks, you know, live center here. It's got one banjo with the tool rest. But it's got um, some other things that make it more interesting, like the, the, the ways look pretty short. They're only maybe two and a half feet long, but there's a, a lock back here and I can um, pull them out and make this a much longer lathe. And so I can do long things. And then the other advantage is um, this, the throat here is, um, gives me the opportunity to do 30 inch diameter. Um, and the whole ways rotates around the circular part here. And then even on top of that, there is this additional banjo and it's kind of a push banjo. So you can, you can come in from the backside, the headstock side and be turning. But also this, this extra ways piece, notice the keyholes on it. It can mount straight out from here. It can mount on, on these bolts and it can mount out here on the far ones. It can mount out here and it can also mount on the far side of the ways. And so it's, it's a pretty versatile lathe. Um, it's not as finely made as the one ways or the American, the American beauties. Um, but it's, it's been really good and it, it fits in a shop a little easier because it's, hmm. it's compact. It's from New Zealand. Um, it was made by a father and son, but I think they have both passed away. Um, and somebody else, they weren't made for several years and then somebody bought the company and is making them again. John Jordan used to sell them in the US um, and mine says John Jordan. Right oh there. yeah. Hmm. So he had that cast into the ways. And Lars, how long have you had this one and how old is it? This one I bought in about 2001. Um, and I can move, well, when I was that age, 21, 20 years ago, I could move it all myself. Um, it's 800 pounds, but it comes apart into pieces that are no more than 150 pounds. But these days I probably can't do that anymore. <laughs> Is that, a, anyway, is, that, so, is that on a concrete floor then? It's a concrete floor. It's, a, it's my garage. Okay. When I want to charge a lot of money, I call it my studio. <laughs> Over on the side here, I have my long tools on. Um, I split a bunch of bamboo and just screwed those on to the wall. So I have all my long tools over there. I have all my other tools in this big Craftsman toolbox. Um, it took me a long time to buy this. There, you know, it's a thousand dollars for the, the toolbox. Um, but man, is it worth it? I love having this big toolbox, and everything is in it. Um, it just everything fits. It's great. Um, and there's a there's a chuck up there that Jim Duxbury sold me a long time ago. Over here, I have my sharpening station with um, a, reg a paint stone and a diamond wheel and my Wolverine setup. Um, there's an air compressor hiding back behind there somewhere. Over here where my laptop is, um, this is my workbench where I pound on things or, you know, do work where I'm standing up. And I've got a bunch of pieces laid out there now it's where my vice is, hammers, saws. And then over in the front of the garage, I have a desk where I do um, sitting down kind of work, like painting or burning. Um, that kind of thing. Um, and so it, my, my sons it really did a nice job in reorganizing the space for me over the last year. So the other thing I wanted to show you real quick was, um, oh, I wanted to reiterate, um, I wanted to reiterate what Steve said at the beginning that we're, I'm gonna be talking about burning tonight and you don't want, you know, you don't even want a one in a thousand chance of something going wrong. And so a fire extinguisher is imperative. I always have a bucket of water, a big tub of water, you know, one of those, those wash tubs. Um, 
and I never leave a piece that I've been burning. I all well, I never leave it. I just I always throw it into the tub of water, so that there's no chance that it can burn. I've heard stories about people's wood turnings getting little embers catching on fire and burning the whole piece to ashes. Luckily, they did it in their driveway, so it was just a pile of ashes in their driveway when they came back. Um, fire, you know, fire is dangerous, and and it needs to have a real healthy respect. So. With that, there I think of burning. Um, there are four different kinds of burning. Um, there's sort of the pyrography where you're where you're drawing on the wood, something like this this piece with the maple leaves, where I used a knife blade, and just burned the outlines of the leaves. Um, over here, I have a bunch of branded pieces. This is where you, you have a tip and you just touch it to the wood and move it, touch it, move it, touch it, move it. And so you have some of these pieces like this that, that you, you make these special tips that are, they look like springs or something. And then this one in the back, um, this one I branded the inside and the outside with just sort of a, a hexagonal spiral. Nice. And so that's that's just branding. So that doesn't take any artistic talent at all. You just touch, lift up, go over, touch. It's very um, just very repetitive. You can just move over. Um, so those are there's pyrography, there's branding. There's scorching, which is just taking your propane torch, and that's what we're going to do one of those tonight. This is a sphere I made, and I, I tried to cut a, a, a yin and yang symbol in the top. Um, for I was really, I really had this nice piece of cedar, this whole tree, and I must have made, I don't know, a dozen spheres out of it, big ones too. Um, so that's just scorching, where you're just taking a torch and um, just burning away and scraping away the charcoal. And then the last kind of burning that I want to talk about, and we're going to do this tonight in the video, Doug Fisher from Vancouver or Laurent Niclot from France or Jack Bessery from up in Maine. Really, you're, you're using the wood burner as a sculpting tool and removing wood as almost as if you're carving. And this was a piece I, I made after I saw Laurent Niclot. And I'll show that, that'll show up better in the video. Go straight to the video now, unless anybody wants to ask any questions. The cedar bowl that you burned, was that what Western cedar or Eastern red cedar? Um, everything I have is, is just local. So it's Eastern red. Oh, I have burned some Western, I had a pallet or something that was made out of Western red cedar, Western cedar. And it's kind of white. Is that how you tell the difference? It's, it's, it's more white, it's not nearly as red. And um, it burns pretty well too. They, I like cedar, I like burning cedar quite a lot. Plus yeah. over the last five years, how much percentage of your time have you spent on creating pieces that burn, not of your time, but how many of your pieces have been burned pieces and how much other turning do you do? Um, I probably burn most of them. <laughs> And how long have you been in that field? In the burning? Yeah. I was thinking about that. It's um, my younger son is 18 and we, we started when we were up in the mountains and um, I didn't have any sandpaper and I had, a, I had a weed torch. And so I had this bowl and it, it, it cracked and he was about eight, so maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. If I didn't know any better, I would assume that Stefan was trying to uh, diagnose you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to share my screen and play the video. And it'll come in um, three pieces. There'll be a turning part, a scorching burning part, and a um, handheld burning part. And, and we'll take a little break about it every 20 minutes. Um, welcome to my shop. Um, today I wanted to um, go through a project of, of 
turning uh, a burn piece, well turning the piece first and then burning it, and something that is along these lines. And I started thinking about this design, you know, six or six or eight. Lars, are you share the right screen? Turn a shallow curve yeah. on the top, a little bit more of a curve on the bottom. I can see it. Okay, yeah, Steve, are you not seeing it, Steve? No, but the, uh, you I, might I, have the I, wrong I, window hidden. I, I'll fix it. Go ahead. All right. Leave a leave a rim for decoration, and then uh, burn it with a torch around the outside, and then burn it with a burning tool, a handheld electric tool, to make the the rim decorated and then apply some kind of paint or gilder's paste to it. Uh, these, are, these are some examples of what I'm uh, hoping to make today. Um, this is a, an example made out of pine, and the pine um, grain shows off the undulations the most. It has such a big variation between the soft and the hardwoods. And um, it also burns away at the softwood more, so you get the scalloping out on on the edges here and over here on the on the end grain. Um, and the general design was to have the, a rimmed a rimmed figure, a rim bowl, with a gentle curve down the top, and then a, a bit more of a curve on the bottom, bringing it up. And this one I put a foot on, but I don't. I'm I'm not recommending that. So this is this is an example, and I burn the inside, so the grain is even shown off on the inside of the piece as well. Um, here's a second piece I did, and I was trying I was trying to figure out if the curve was good or not. And this piece, I made the top perfectly flat, and put some grooves in it around. Um, I don't like it as much, although I did have fun experimenting with this blue gilders wax. And I, I even put the gilding wax inside, and you can see that it shows off the grain inside, and it kind of makes um, it's a, a surprise for people who are looking at it. Um, this again is pine. Um, the pith is over here; it's not in the center. So this piece is definitely um, not great. Uh, after I made those, I went and got a piece of cherry. This is from a neighbor's tree that came down. And um, I burned it away on the outside and then treated the rim. And then I dyed the inside. I think you can see that it's it's red. Some of the kids in our neighborhood call it. It's like red velvet cake. Um, and then I painted it with copper paint and gold paint and a couple other things. Um, and then the whole thing is finished with lacquer, spray lacquer. And again, you can see the simple shape. There's a, a gentle curve across the top, a little bit more upswept curve on the bottom. And this one I put more of a foot on. Um, and it has a little bit of the exterior of the tree left on here. That gives it even more of a, a nice texture, a nice feel, more organic feel. And, and where that's close, it, it burns away a um, little bit more, a little bit less, and gives it more of a texture. Um, so that's pine and cherry. I also like burning cedar. Cedar um, doesn't, the softwood doesn't burn away as much as it does with pine. And I think it's actually the prettiest wood to burn. This was an experimental piece that um, has several failures on it. But what I wanted to show, this is unfinished. This has been burned. Um, and all the all the char, all the carbon has been scraped off with um, a plastic brush, and and you get this this medium brown color. It's darker than the wood was originally, but it's not black. The thing that I found is that no matter what you finish this with, whether it's wax or oil or polyurethane or lacquer or acrylic, it's gonna end up pretty black. Um, this cherry piece was about the same color, maybe even a little lighter. Um, I dyed it red like it is on the inside and then I put lacquer on it and it went pretty near black. Um, and then this is another piece of cedar. Um, 
that I haven't finished quite yet, but it's the same idea. There, it's a little narrower. It was a smaller tree. This is, um, yeah, this is from a cedar tree. A little bit of curve on the top, more curve on the bottom. You get the pith right through the center of the top part, and then the long grain over here. So this is the, this is the kind of wood um, we're going to use today. It's a piece of 2x8, um, just from somewhere like Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, pine, it, it has, you can see, the, the growth rings on the tree. They, they tend to cut the wider boards right with the pith right at the surface of the wood. Um, maybe they cut two by fours over here, and or I've, I've seen plenty of two by fours with the pith down the middle. Um, but this is what this is what we're going to use today. Uh, this is a fairly nice piece. The the pith is right, almost exactly in the center of the board, and so that'll show up nicely um, in the piece. The other thing, uh, the other one I wanted to show you. This is a piece my neighbor is working on his house. And this is a 2 by 10 that he um, didn't need anymore. It's just some scrap. And the again, the pith is almost in the center. It's, it's much wider, so I have room to make it in the center. I can follow the pith, and it's a little bit at an angle, so I can, I can make this, the diameter along the pith there. So now it's time to mount the piece. Um, I'm going to use a screw chuck today, the, the one-way stronghold. It goes in the chuck, and then, then we're going to we drill the hole, not too deep, hopefully just deep enough to mount on here. This out of the way, and we'll start threading it on, trying to keep it so that it's perpendicular to the ways. So we got it mounted on the lathe, we've got the tail stock up pushing a hole into it so we can register it when we flip it around and then flip it around to take the, the tenon off. Um, I'm going to make a tenon now. I'm gonna, actually, it's a little too close, I need a little more room for my banjo. Bring it in here. take the corners off and then we'll curve it and put a tenon on it. I have my big fat roughing gouge and um, start cut. I forgot to put on my safety equipment. This is my chainsaw helmet. Um, it has a wire mesh in front that keeps the shavings from hitting me in the face. I really don't like getting hit in the face. Um, and I like it better than a plastic face shield um, just because air can move freely. Um, so anyway, let's get back to cutting. Okay. nice and round. Now I can work on the and put a ten in there. It's going to be just a, a smooth curve um, and it's going to go about two-thirds of the way through the material. I'm 
I'm going to set the tool rest at about the angle I want it to go. big tool away and go for a smaller tool and you know, look and see how close I am. This this wrench has about the same size as the jaws of the chuck. I'm going a little bit more. Looks pretty good. We got a little knot here that'll add some little bit of flavor to it. Um, but it all looks pretty good. I've got a, a short, but a, a tenon's fine. It'll it'll work out. And uh, we're ready to flip it over. good and um, so we flipped it around I got I took the tailstock off um, I got the hole we drilled and that hole goes to the depth we want I don't want to go any deeper than that there just isn't that much wood in this um, in this piece of wood um, we're gonna cut a hole maybe about that big and the rim about that big And so from this line, we're going to bring it, we're going to leave this part raised and then we're going to bring this down to meet the bottom cut and it'll be, it'll be pretty sharp. And then we'll hollow out the center and before we move on to the next step. So I'm going to use my deep fluted gouge, um, more pull cuts. my um, 
detail gouge with the really shallow flute and use it in a shearing mechanism where the cutting aid edge is at 45 degrees so you get these nice peel peeling cuts and then we'll get rid of a lot of the tear out um, and, and I can sharpen up this edge a little more and make it all match and get a really nice curve. So I'm pulling it in about the angle of sort of the middle of the curve so it's a little less steep and then a little more steep. a little bit and clean this edge up just a little bit and then we can move on to the hollow. Put a little crown on the rim. Um, you can see what the grain is doing here, how you get in the round parts sticking through. They're almost centered on the center of the piece. Um, it'll, it's going to burn quite nicely. So next I'm going to hollow that out <clears throat> with bowl gouge. Um, picked the wrong one. This is um, the Hamlet tools or the Packard, the 2060 metal. I really like them, but they don't make them anymore. Uh, and so I, I'm cherishing this one. And I'm going to use it to hollow right down in there. All right, so we're going to hollow this. We're going to use a normal bowl, bowl hollowing sort of strategy until I get the walls about straight, straight in, and then we'll turn to hollowing tools. Let's start right over here. More speed. good. So we next I'm going to hollow under and just give it a, a bit of a hollow form appearance. For the hollowing I like using these um, Trent Bosch tools. I got them when he came, whatever that was, a year, two years ago he came and gave a, a demonstration at our club and I bought these from him during the workshop. Um, this is the straight tool. Uh, I'm not going to use that today. Normally you would use it on a deeper hollow form to go straight into the bottom and, and clean it out to give you room to use the bent tool, this bent tool, which is meant to ride on the tool rest back here. The tip is in line with the, the axis of the bar. And then the cut, this, this bent tip can reach around under and dig stuff out. And after we're done hollowing, using this to hollow out the, the piece a little bit, and I'll come back and, and grab this tool, which is a scraper, which is just, you know, to cut ever so slightly just to smooth out all of the um, rough turning that you did. 
and make a make a better inside. These hook into a handle that he sells, and the purple one matches the diameter of this tool. And I like to use one of these long T Allen wrenches. It has a bit of spring in it, so when you get here, you can give it a little bounce on the set screw, and you know it's you know it's in good. So I'm using I'm using the vent scraper now, and the tool rest has to be moved back a bit so that the straight part the straight part of the bar is resting on the tool rest, and I want it so that it's just you know almost it's I want it to be flat. I want it to be level. It's a little bit low. I'll bring it up. And so we can come across and, and dig in behind the rim here and hollow it out. Not too far, maybe just an inch. Maybe not even quite that far. All right, so ready to hollow it out. That's all I'm going to go in on this one. I'm going to I'm going to change the tool to the scraper and clean up the surface a little bit. Okay. So here we, I put the, um, the scraping tool on, and um, I'll use it to smooth out the bottom. Again, it's got the bent part and then the straight part, and you want the tool rest back here, not up here. That's all it takes. So we're done with the top side and now we'll flip it over and clean up the bottom. All right, so we're gonna flip this around. I put the tailstock back up. Um, get it out of the chuck. And you can see the shape is starting to look good. Um, I might be able to just put it over this chuck. Yes. Use it as an expansion chuck, just very gingerly. And then you bring the tailstock up. Now I'm going to take off the um, spigot, the tenon, and put a, just a slight dish in for the base. Nothing special there. So.
looks like about it. And pull it off. There's a slight base here, nice pattern on the wood, nice pattern on the top. We've got a rim that we can work on. Um, I don't worry about the scarring from the chuck because this is all going to be burned. So um, that doesn't matter. Anyway, that's it. It's ready to burn. Uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, there was Lars, if you stop sharing your screen, there you go. There was a question in the chat. Uh, a couple questions in the chat. First one was, are you using the Ron Brown jig to get your 4040 grind? I am. I have it right here. Um, put it in front of this light thing. Is the 4040 jig that um, Mike Willat and I both bought one. We started emailing back and forth, and it's it's a pretty handy tool. It's I mean it's about you know it's about 25 cents worth of plastic, but it costs about I forget 25 dollars. And the real thing is the ingenuity behind the shape, and um, it works well with the Wolverine system. And um, every tool that goes into my Wolverine jig um, is a 4040 grind. You think that might mean the same thing on all the tools? It does not. There's still the profile that you cut on the edge that can change the deep bowl gouges quite dramatically. They're quite different from the um, detail gouges. How do you use it? How do you how do you make it work? Oh, um, well, you you take your you take your Wolverine um, jig. Yes. You flip the leg all the way back, you put, um, you put this in this way, into your jig and tighten it up. And then you set this in, you set this in your, in the, the, the V trough. Yeah, the trough. trough. And you put it, put it so that these two points are on the on the grinding wheel. So now your distance is set for your for your the the leg coming out, and then you take it back out. How about that? How about that? And you get one of your tools, and when you put the tool in the um, in the jig, you use the back tail here to set the distance. How about that? And tighten it up, and then you're good to go. And it, the same every single time. And it only takes the lightest touch to get a new face all the way around the um, tool, around the cutting edge. Pretty handy. I'm, I'm really enjoying this tool. It's made, I didn't really like the Thompson tool very much when I first bought it. And then I started grinding with this, and I liked it a lot better. Um, so this, this has made a big difference to me. Thank you. Lars, there's a, and I don't really want to go to a, don't have time to go to a whole lot on the on the uh, Bosch sure. hollowing system, but there was a question about how you sharpen the tips. Uh, that's pretty easy. You just um, you just come up to the grinding wheel, a little bit tilted back, and you slide off the edge of the grinding wheel, back and forth, back and forth. And those, it takes almost nothing to sharpen those. You just need to get a little bit of shine on them. Oh no, are the tips removable? Like on they the are. Hard they're, they're, he um, he super glues them in, and to get them out, you just touch it with a torch, and the super glue boils and pops it right out. And um, then you get you're, it. Out, put you're some not, super glue, stick it back you're, in. You're not removing them to sharpening though. You sharpen them right right in the holder. Right, the whole the whole bar goes right over to the grinder. Okay. I have another question. When you are shaping the outside of the bowl. Um, the, the video was freezing a little bit, but oh, sorry. it looked like you were cutting in both directions. Is that the case? 
that is absolutely the case. Um, I was using a wolf cut most of the time with the, the flute over towards me instead of a, a push with the flute away. Uh, I just find that it works better. Uh, it, you know, I don't know. There were there was that battle between Stuart Batty and um, the Mike Mahoney push cut pull cut on the outside of a bowl, and they they had they had a fun video that was a long time ago, ten years ago. Um, the pull cut I find it easier just because the lathe is mostly in the way to do a push cut, but um, the short lathe I can I can go around the end of the lathe and do a push cut. But in that case, I just went back and forth and it's almost flat. And so it, it doesn't really matter that much. And even if it does matter, if you get tear out, we're gonna burn it and the tear out is gonna go away. So yeah, I was, put, I was cutting uphill. So you're just cutting with one wing, right? Or you're using both one wing. One wing. Is it kind of a sheer cut or is it? Straight? At the end it is. Um, at the end I had the tool tilted up so that the the wood coming down is hitting a 45 degree angle and you get the, you get spiral cuts coming off of it. Thank you. You're on. Uh, Bart's got a question that says, you mentioned about balancing the grain on the face. How do you correct this? How do you correct for this during turning? <laughs> um, I don't think I usually do. I think I usually just go, I try and set it up at the beginning and you can, you know, you can look at the ends of the timber and and kind of give an idea of where the rings are, but um, I just let it go after that. I just see what happens. Okay. There was uh, one more. Is there another question? No, I think that's uh, that's all that's in the chat right now. Um, the, the other point I wanted to say is that the shape, having a smooth curve at this point matters. Um, it matters maybe even more so than if you're gonna just sand this and finish it the normal way. Um, the soft wood is going to burn away, but the hardwood um, really surprisingly stay last through the burning. And um, some some of my pieces still have tool marks on them, even though they've been burned a couple times. And so the shape, getting that profile, you know, smooth, even curve, is is critical at that uh, for this. Lars, you were talking about using pine there. Um, do you use ash or oak, red oak much to burn because of the large grain also? So the ash is a very popular wood to burn. That's what I first saw demoed by Nick Cook. And he turned a bowl with a rim on it and he burned just the rim. So he had a black ring around right, I've seen that. red ash. And um, it looks really good. You get the, the porous part of the ash is really porous and it, it burns really nicely. Um, oak is a different beast. And um, I don't know if you notice over my shoulder, there's a picture up on the wall there. Yes. Uh, um, Max Brosi, the Irish wood turner, he likes to burn oak. And oak is interesting because it has the regular radial grains, you know, the radial rings, but it's got the cross grain as well. And so you get this mesh grain. And I think it's, it's a whole different beast. Um, with the, the flake, the flake makes a radial grain in it. And mm -hmm. so I think it takes, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a different, I haven't, I haven't been happy with my oak burnings yet. Although those drunken Irishmen that Max Brosi turns, I think are gorgeous. And that's why they're up on my wall. So they'll just soak in and one day I'll be able to make those perfectly. Thanks Lars. You're welcome. All right, we're ready to continue. Yep. There's one more question about the, on the chat. Okay. I can't. Question, uh, what was the name of that piece of plastic? You know who made it? Or oh, um, I, the Ron Brown. Right? Ron Brown. It's the Ron Bra Ron Brown tool. Yeah. Where can you buy it? I bought it from his website. Ron yeah, just go to Ron. I, if you Google Ron Brown lathe tools or something, you, you go right to his website. That's the, I think that may be the only place where you can buy it. All right, Lars. 
and the movie player has disappeared from my sharing choices. <laughs> so if you share, uh, oh. I'll share the whole thing. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, we can see it. Go ahead and play, I think. Yeah. All right. So this, the second portion is about the scorching. So um, here we have a piece that's um, been finished turning and is now ready for burning. Um, for burning, I use, I just use this sort of ordinary butane torch or propane torch tip. This one is a micro tip, they called it when I bought it. Um, it's gotten dented over the years and it's black. It's not an auto start, but I have a handy big lighter. And um, I just use this to wash over the, the wood and I'll start doing that right now. I usually tilt it back so the heat rides up the back of the, the turning and you can get a flame going. I want, it, I want it so that everything is black, not just the softwood. And that the, the charcoal, the outer surface, starts to crack from being burned. Not, not crack, cracks into the wood, just, cra just cracks into the charcoal. There's a little more burning uh, on this piece that where I got interrupted in the rain. Start down here at the bottom. I'm inside today, but I'm just inside the door. I've got double doors wide open. So I get ventilation. It's raining out today. I don't want to sit outside. A nice rolling flame going up the. That's why I start at the bottom. I bring the get a flame rolling like that and bring it right up the side. Get double duty out of the propane that you're burning. Bring it back so that the light blue tip in the center of the flame is not touching the wood, and it'll ignite into a flame much more readily. Trying to get the char to crack. Right, you can see the crack.
I wonder what and system we set up at NC State. Guess I just need to throw this in there for some reason. And it's okay if it catches on fire. This um, this tends to add um, character to the edge. It, it'll these it'll make embers, little glowing embers, and those will eat away at the wood a bit more. Uh, I tend to encourage those rather than shy away from them. The thinner the wood is, the easier it is to just get it light, lit on fire. The flames go too crazy. Add a little bit of tear out on this piece. The tear out is in the soft grain, the spring growth. And the burning takes away the spring growth more than the fall growth. So, uh, shouldn't be a problem. Make sure that the burn depth is about the same everywhere. I have some examples of where I did not succeed at that. And it's, uh, it just means you have to go back and reburn everything and try and burn heavily where you didn't burn heavily in the first time the first time. Lars, people are asking if we've lost audio. I suspect there's just no audio in this part of the video. No, I, I ran it on high speed, and I didn't want to sound like um, a little mouse. So I, I just turned down the audio. Um, I'm just going around. At this point, I'm just going around and touching up where um, it isn't evenly deep. There isn't an even amount of cracking in the, in the charcoal. So I'm just trying to touch it up a little bit. And 
I'll start talking again in a second. And people ask me if I burn myself, and certainly my hands get hot. But um, you know, this is something that you're good at—is sensing heat and and getting away from it. So um, it may look dangerous, but this is what you need to do. Do you ever set the torch down on the table and just maneuver the feet? Uh, sometimes. That's what the good. Nice and charred. Now we can uh, scrape it down. It's surprisingly hot in here. The moisture that picked up on the end grain, when then you come back and torch it again, and the moisture that soaked into the wood now comes out of steam here. So you're holding it like this, and your tips of your fingers are getting a little steam bath. The other tools I wanted to show you today, um, they all go into a, a a drill or something that spins them around. Um, so these these three are called nylox, and they're made of nylon. And um, this one has the thickest fibers. This one's the medium, and this one's got the finest fibers. Put those in a drill and spin them around, and they will take off all the char. Um, the two heavier ones tend to leave marks. The light, lightest weight one, this blue one, uh, does not leave marks. And so it's pretty nice. It's just that it's motorized. It, it's more aggressive. Um, you use it dry. It kicks up a lot of dust. So you need to have the dust collection working. All right. Um, this is something I bought a long time ago. Um, it's too abrasive for anything. So I can't use it for this. This one looked a little less abrasive. It's kind of plasticky, um, but it this thing is very aggressive and it tears the wood to shreds. Um, and then finally, I have instead of the stainless steel hand brush, I have stainless steel on a wheel. Um, again, I just I don't tend to use these. They they tear the wood up too much, and you don't have as much control. So these are the different powered options you have, um, but I'm not going to use those today. Uh, so we've we've burned one of the bowls, and um, I wanted to show you how I know how deep to go. Let's see if I can work this by myself. I wanted to burn until you get the um, the charred areas to start cracking, and I think you can see it a little bit right here and across the top. And so that's about how much to get to burn down. I usually just um, scrape these by hand with a brush. Uh, this one. Is a stainless steel brush. Um, it's got the most of the bristles here with some extra bristles out here. There's a brass one. same configuration and then I've got here I've got two plastic ones um, the, the one with the yellow plastic handle this one these these bristles are much stiffer than um, whatever set of brushes that this black one is I got the yellow and gray ones at the Dollar General store probably for a dollar and I think I got six I think I got two of the steel brass and, and plastic in one bag for a dollar. It's quite a good deal. You're going to use these on the dry surface. You start scraping and the steel and the brass will tend to cut into the softwood. You can see it makes a whole bunch of dust and so um, 
you either have to put on a dust mask or um, what I like to do is wet wet scrape them and I'll show you that in a second. The way I prefer to um, remove the charred material is um, to take one of these brushes, take a vat of water, a vat of water, and I put a little bit of dish soap in it to break the surface tension of the water. And then I just dip it in and, and start scraping. And right now I'm using the, the plastic brush, um, but I think I'm going to go straight to the steel brush. This is the first burn. We're going to burn it twice. Um, just to make the grain stand out a little more. And I usually try and go with the grooves. It's making marks in the softwood. You can see it's building up this mook. And I rinse it off every so often. And you might be able to see the wood lightening up a little bit where I've scraped off the charred material. So I do this and it, it takes a little while. It's always fun to see the patterns emerge. So around these sort of hill patterns, I try and move with the grain so I don't dig in too deeply in across the grain. And it looks better and better. Around the, the foot, I usually go in a circular motion. You could stay with the grain if you wanted to. This wood is burned particularly nicely. Let's see if I can get a good reflection for you. There you go. Yeah, this one's going to be pretty nice. It's a, it's a nice shape. It's got a nice rim, nice wide opening. It's got grass on it. This piece of pine is particularly nice. The grain is quite close together. It's not like your ordinary wood you get at Lowe's or Home Depot where the grain is, each growth ring is a quarter inch or more. These are more like um, an eighth or even smaller than an eighth of an inch. It's a very nice texture. You can see the scalloped edge starting to form. So some of the burn doesn't come off. I grab a piece of sandpaper and just stick down a little bit. That's sort of the sanded end, the unsanded end. These ridges are a little higher, they're a little choppier, a little rough to the touch. So I'll sand those down too. Here's what it looks like after the first burn and the first scraping. Um, you can see that the softwood scraped off more of the char. There's a knot right over here that's going to be quite nice. And as I was saying, this one has particularly tight grain. Uh, it's very nice. It's maybe what you get when you get a 2x10 instead of a 2x6 or a 2x8. Certainly more than a 2x4. So that's what it looks like after the first burn. We're going to burn it again. 
and then scrape it again. But the second time I scrape it, I'm going to use the um, plastic brush so I don't get any, any bristle marks at all. Alright, it's time for the second burn. So I'm going to fire this up. How long do you dry them between burning them the second time? I think Lars is muted right now, Bob, and uh, he, because he's sharing his screen, he can't get back to unmute. So hold your question. We'll get it when he get on the break. That's all right. Um, um, I let him dry. Oh, probably an hour. All right. So I've, I've finished burning this the second time. It's, it's charred all around um, the outer part of the rim up here and charred across the bottom. And so now it's time to scrape all the char off. Um, instead of using one of these wire brushes, the brass or the stainless steel, I'm going to go with this stiff um, black plastic brush because it won't scratch the softwood. And, you know, again, it's just going to be a process of dipping it in the water and starting to scrape. Um, so I finished scraping with the plastic brush, and there's still um, there's still quite a bit of residual char on the on the hardwood, and so I've got I've grabbed a piece of um, 400 grit sandpaper, and I'm just gonna take that down. It doesn't take much sanding at all. It, it's just charcoal. It's very it's very easy to sand. And again, the reason I'm doing this wet is um, the amount of dust this makes. Um, is incredible and um, doing it doing it wet keeps all the dust in the water and so so this makes the um, the undulations between the hard and the soft grain uh, much smoother and um, it's much more pleasant to the touch all right, so um, the next step, I'm going to, um, at this point, you can uh, color the wood, or um, in this case, I'm going to just make it black with some, um, I have a, a big bottle of India ink, super black. Um, but the first thing I want to do is, there's, there's some lint on it, I want to get all that off. I'll just do a little brushing. All right, and so, first I'm going to work on the inside so I'll just squirt some ink in there and um, I just don't want the inside to stand out I want it to just be dark and recessed and I want all of the wood to be black in there the painting it black makes it um, so that the, any any variation in the wood color is now just all black and it gives you a uniform surface to go from, a uniform color. All right, here's the, here's the, all right, um, 
Are there any questions built up? Lars, there's a question about, so you talked about how long you let it dry between the first burn and the second burn. And then, I mean, do you use a heat gun or anything to dry it out or do you just, just um, let it air dry? I just let it air dry. And I probably, certainly a couple hours, maybe maybe even a day, just do something else the rest of the day or uh, just let it dry out. It's been so windy and dry the last week or two that um, it actually has been drying real quickly. And, uh Lars, Rita had a question about uh, going back. It, do you, after you burn it, do you ever go back to the lathe and do any cleanup on the lathe? She was uh, questioning specifically the rim in the interior, which you're going to talk about the rim now, I know. But the interior piece, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, if, the, if, the, if the opening is wide, like, like these are, this biggest, big wide opening, you can get the flame in there. When you have a piece that, when you have a piece that's more like this with this tiny opening, um, there's no way to get the flame to go all the way to the bottom and burn it. And so on on this piece, it's just rough down there. I don't I didn't sand the inside like um, Chris does. Um, but well, I, I thought you were going to probably um, leave. I thought you were probably going to leave natural wood in the middle. I didn't realize you were going to burn right through or color right through. No, I, I burn. I burn to the bottom, and um, that makes the bottom. If it's a wide mouth, people put their fingers down there, and they want to feel the texture down there as well. And, and one so, of the and somebody else had a question about. How many burns you can do with one propane tank? <laughs> a lot. Um, <laughs> I think I just changed that propane tank for the first, no, the second time in 11 years. Oh. So it, it lasts a long time. Yeah, that, that's the, the larger camping stove tank rather than the smaller cylinder you get like with the uh, propane torch kits. Right. Any words, Lars, on what heat to use? Are there different settings, very hot or not so hot? Advantage uh, of one over the other? Yeah, so so you'd ask a question about cracking. Um, so the heat does crack the wood on the end grain. Um, you'll get cracks. And um, the more intense your heat is, the more cracking you will get. And so um, if, you, if you have the patience to go lightly and and less you know really i think it has to do with the contrast you if you go at it with a big flame hot heavy the outside of the wood is getting very hot and the inside is still cool and there's a lot of moisture moving around and there's a lot of shrinking going on and there's a lot of tension and so you get cracking if you let if you go with a lighter touch you'll get less cracking Okay, thank you. And I see there's a question about map gas. Map gas is a good deal hotter than propane or butane. And so I haven't used it, um, but I don't think I want to either because of what I just said, it, it'll make the cracking worse. All right, I think we're ready to move on. All right, let me find that. piece after the India ink has dried. It's made a, a nice black um, both sides. Already picked up some dust. Um, and so the next part we're going to work on is this rim and we're going to make it look more like this piece um, on, on this finished one. We're going to use a wood burning tool that I made that looks like this and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, I started practicing this after I saw uh, Laurent Niclot, the young French man, after the symposium in Raleigh. And um, after I saw him, I, I made, I practiced on just some end piece. Um, and it came out really nicely. He, he likes to have louvers and gears and things in his. Um, so that was a fun one to make. 
I practiced on another one, and this was practicing different painting techniques, where I was fading from a pinkish purple over to a bluish green. And that was kind of fun to make also. So the first thing we're going to do on this piece is, is draw some rough outlines of what we want to um, burn, the pattern we want to burn. And so I just think of this like rock walls or, um, you know, pavers or something. And I just start drawing on here. So I don't try to be regular or anything. I just keep going around and mark it. And maybe just draw a few more lines out to the edges. Um, all right, this is the burning tool that I've made. Um, I got excited about burning a while ago and saw these plans for building a, a wood burning kit out of a manual battery charger. Um, at this point, I don't recommend it. Just go ahead and get one of those Burnmaster Eagle or Burnmaster, and um, it's just a lot easier. The The battery chargers aren't really made for the kind of load you put on them and they overheat. But this is one I made. It's I made this piece of walnut. It's hollowed out. I put two brass rods through it. I tapped them, and then I, I just put these little um, set screws in so that I can tighten the tips in. Um, and <clears throat> this has worked pretty well. I've made a knife shape here, and you tend to keep this thing sharp with a little sharpening stone. So it, it not only is it red hot, but it's sharp, so that it cuts through the wood nicely. And you can make, <clears throat> to make the tips, I have um, three different grades of nichrome wire. I've 18 gauge, 16 gauge, and 20 gauge. And um, the, the 20 is a little light. The 18 I use most of the time. The 16 I use um, for hit bigger piece, bigger um, burning tips. And what I typically do with them to make, to make the knife edge is I, I cut about two inches, bend it in half. I have my own piece of railroad rail. I take a ball peen hammer smash it flat on here, and then um, polish it up on the grinding wheel. Um, I've, made, I've made quite a number of tips. Um, these spiral ones, you, you wrap around a drill bit. They're all kind of burnt and cruddy looking, but they work really well. Um, we made, I made a brand, so this, this all gets red hot, and you just touch it on the wood over and over and over again. Um, I made some long sharp edges that are slightly curved. It's, it's just pretty sharp and you can just go along the wood. Just a whole pile of them. Um, little spiral dots like Molly um, Winton makes. You know, just a collection and you can make them cost nearly nothing to buy this nichrome wire. All right, this is my die hard um, battery charger. I cut a hole in it and put a sliding switch that I got from Lowe's. This has to be a particular kind of sliding switch. Um, I wrote on it low, high, on, off. So now it's on. And I can slide this switch over. And the tip is starting to get hot. I can smell it burning. And you can see it starting to glow red. When I'm doing the first stage of the burning, I want the tip to be a very straight. It's got a little bend in it right now, so I can just grab it with a needle nose and flatten it out. That looks pretty good. The needle. All right, um, so we're going to start burning. The first thing I'm going to do is um, trace all the lines and also give it some texture inside the in the inner edge of the rim. And it's not getting hot yet. Turn it up a little bit and just start.
try one more time around and we'll be finished with the outlining and we'll get to the sculpting part. All right, so the next thing to do is to put some texture on each of these um, tiles, on each of these outlined areas. And to do that, I'm going to um, I'm going to turn the tip up a little so I can use it more like a spoon and smear the wood. Um, I'm going to wait till it's a little bit hotter and then just give it a little um, little bend. It's starting to get red. Just a little bend, so I can smear it a little bit. And then, typically what I do is, I'm going to push really hard on the left side of each tile and bring it up and barely burn any on the right side. And then same from the front, the inner edge to the back. The inner edge is going to go down, and the, the outer edge is going to be almost as high as it is now. So I do something like this, where I just start leaning on it and get over to the other side and just do enough to blacken it and the same with the outer edge there's not much taken away here so I've, I've taken away a bit on the left and inner edge and so it, it makes it look like they're overlapping so again I'll just do that and then lightly burn over to the right and to the outer edge. And you burn everywhere. Um, gives it a nice texture. More metallic or leathery looking. Pounded looking. All right, I'm going to continue um, lowering the inner and left side of each tile. I'm out on the second row now. <coughs> the smoke breaking the top. All right, that's about it for um, the burning and sculpting. Brush it off a little bit, and then we'll look at painting. It's got a nice, a nice texture on it. All right, so um, the next step we're going to do is I'm going to paint the rim pretty heavily with paint so that everywhere is painted. Um, with uh, this color brown, sienna, and then some quinacridone crimson. Um, one thing I like mixing paint on are these Amazon Prime envelopes. They're, they usually start out pretty clean and I just squirt some paint on there. That's way too much. And then uh, get a little bit of this, this crimson color on it. Oh. These are just acrylic paints that I bought at um, AC Moore or Michaels. And then I want the paints not to mix together all the way. I want 
variation. So I'm not mixing them together very heavily. And I want to watch out for going off the edge. And then uh, a technique I learned from um, Jack Pessary is dry brushing where you get a little paint on and then you try and get rid of most of it. And you just can go around and it just touches the, the high spots. And it's not really doing much here. Maybe I'll add a little brown here. No, it's, that's pretty good. All right, and then um, to finish up the rim, I'm going to use a little bit of this um, gold paint. Just put a little dab out here. And we're going to just dry brush this onto the high edges of this burned area. So I'll get a little bit out and then smear it out. And then start just lightly going over this. and just pick up the outer edges. Looks pretty good. So the next step will, um, the final that will be in the final steps. I'm going to um, make sure the India ink is still covering everywhere. I see a light spot right over here. Um, brush it all off, and then put on a couple coats of lacquer. Um, so we're gonna um, put some lacquer on um, these two pieces. The, the piece in front is the piece we turned uh, yesterday and burned yesterday. Um, the piece in back is the cedar piece, and it doesn't have any of the India ink on it. And what I wanted to show was how black it's going to get, um, even though it is kind of a coffee color right now. Um, so I've got my, my Krylon spray, and I'm outside. Um, hopefully there's not too much pollen in the trees, but it's, it's that time of year. Um, so now we're just going to do some light spraying. Good. Doing this outside, I can walk around the piece when I'm to touch it. It's soaking in quite heavily on the cedar. I'm not liking this uh, spray tip on the Krylon can very much yet today. It's really goopy. We're getting a lot of soak in. 
All right, so we finally, um, I finally finished these. I put a, I put a coat of lacquer on. Um, I didn't really like the way the lacquer was going on, so I put a coat of clear acrylic on. And it's a bit too shiny for my taste. Um, hopefully you can see how it's finished up. And um, so to, to get rid of the shine, I used the, um, the Nylox brush, the fine one, and knocked, just lightly touched it and knocked the shine off on the back here on the bottom. And then uh, that leaves a dull finish, and then I smeared some beeswax on and then rubbed it back off. And it leaves, it, it, it's a nice, it's a duller shine that I like better. And it feels better to the touch. It's, it's more slippery. The plasticky touch is, grips your fingers and doesn't feel that good. Um, so here, this is the piece we've been working on and it is almost finished. Um, I'm pretty pleased with the way it came out. Uh, like I was saying earlier, the grain is, the grain in the wood is, is nice. Um, and, and the inner rim came out pretty well as well. Um, just for a few other things, I tried using some yellow dye on this piece with the Nylox brush, these Nylox brushes. Um, and I used the yellow dye and then put a coat of um, acrylic on it and uh, it has a different look. I'm not sure if it's one I like or not, but um, uh, I'll probably go ahead and finish this one. Uh, and then here's a hollow form that I did in pretty much the same manner. Although it's finished in a slightly different way, I, I put it back on the lathe after it was charred and, and spun it with the brushes on it. So it, it makes these, these grooves of charcoal around that also contrast with the grain grooves. And then I did the same sort of treatment on the rim. And so um, these are what I wanted to show you, and I hope you've enjoyed watching the creation of these, these pieces. Thank you. Welcome. Lars, I had a few questions about the, um, the spray that you were using, both the lacquer and the acrylic. Yeah. Um, I'm grabbing it. What are the questions? Uh, what, what, what are they? <laughs> well, so I was using... Can you, spot, can you spotlight him? Um, spotlight uh, Lars? Yeah, I will. I was using this deft clear wood finish, um, and I really liked that quite a lot, um, but it got empty. And the next time I was over at Lowe's, I picked up some Krylon lacquer. And um, I hate this. I think it's going in the trash can. Um, the, the, the spray tip, um, it's like it's spitting on the wood. And you get these big drops. You get a lot of drips forming. Um, I didn't like it very much at all. But at the same time, I bought this um, Krylon clear finish. I think it's acrylic. Um, they never say when it's acrylic. They just say all this crystal clear stuff. Um, this one has a different a different spray tip. It's more of a traditional, what you would expect from years ago. And the, this one is is this little pin top. And the deft one had the same top as that, but um, this one was horrible. So. Um, I didn't really like the Krylon. I found this over the years that different brands of spray, it makes a big difference which brands you buy. And I buy them so rarely, I forget which ones are good and which ones are bad. But now I know to stay away from the, the Krylon lacquer. Um, but I don't know which ones are good. I, I like the Deft quite a lot. It went, on, it went on in a nice smooth mist and it didn't drip much. Right. I have all the questions from the chat. Any, anybody else have any other questions? You can just unmute yourself, either press your space bar or just unmute. Right. Lars, do you um, only use kiln dried lumber when you're doing these? Um, 
I hardly ever use kiln dried lumber, actually. Um, well, it looked like that two by eight from uh, Home Depot was kiln dried. These were, the, these few pieces are um, just regular lumber from Lowe's. Um, but it's because it sort of, I wanted to burn some pine and um, I was real curious about making a, a very low profile piece. And so the, the two by material was, was exactly fit the bill. It wasn't that I'm super cheap, which I actually am, but um, it's actually what I really wanted. And I, I really wanted to try that low profile with the rim on it. And that's what it gave me. And like I said, my neighbor's doing a lot of construction. So he had a few pieces I could use as well. But usually almost everything I turn is um, green as green can be. And my lathe is so rusty that um, it, it shows. I was, I was shocked when I saw, I think it was Mike Bulat's lathe and it's, his, his lathe is silver and shiny and I'm, mine hasn't looked like that since <laughs> the first week I owned it. <laughs> Lars, have you ever um, tried liming wax or any of those other things to highlight the... Uh... Um, I haven't used liming wax, but I think I showed, I showed this one in one of the show and tells. Instead of, <laughs> instead of hitting the high points, oh, it's not gonna show up very well. Instead of hitting the high points, I painted the whole thing with copper metallic paint. And, and then I just sanded it back. And then um, this has oil on it, an oil finish. And so this, this is doing what the liming wax would. It's, but right. it's, it's more of a paint. Um, it's just these little paint bottles I got from Amazon. And it's like eight different colors of metallic paint. And I chose the copper one for that. And I have, I have some blue and green wax that you can mash into the grain. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah. it's more subtle than the white liming wax. Yeah, I mean, rub and buff or something like that. I think they sell at Michael's. Um, the, it's called Gilder's Paste. And it's, um, it's called Baroque Art. And one, one of these is green, one is blue. I also picked up somewhere along the line, this blue, um, what do they call it? Metallic luster. And, and it, is, it is really metallic. And you can see how much I've used it. I've probably had this eight years and I've barely dipped into it. It, it, it just goes a long way. So you can use any of these and you can, you always have the choice when you burn, you want to, do you want to highlight the high parts or do you want to go deep and, and get, get your finish down in and leave the high parts alone. So you, you can go either way. Lars golden, golden makes um, interference paint, which is really good too. Interference? Have you used that for, with black? No, I haven't. It sounds interesting. It's it's made by Golden. Yeah, it's called yeah. interference. Interfer you paint black, and then you can paint the other thing over it. Let me, and it, it shows through. It's really neat. Okay. Yeah, anything like that that would highlight the the <clears throat> the texture of the grain um, would be fun to play with. Any other? Questions, comments? There was another question in the chat about the paint, if it was any special acrylic paint or assume it was acrylic paint, um, oh. what you chose for that. No, it's, it's. Um, I have a tub of it, the, the golden that, that um, she just mentioned or the Liquitex. Um, and this was a, this was a, we had a big project to do and we needed some brown paint. So I bought this one. These are just all from a store like AC Moore. They're, they're nothing special. And, and they let, you use so little of it when you're doing this kind of work. Um, I haven't even gotten halfway down in any of these tubes yet. Maybe in the, I have th this one that I like a lot called Ivory Black which is a funny name, right? And um, it's a very 
it's an incredibly dark black that is shiny, which is what the ivory part is. And I use that on this piece that is a, a branded piece. I painted the whole thing with black gesso, which is very has a very matte finish and got the gesso all the way down into each of the branding burns. And then I just lightly went over the upper surface with the, the ivory black, which is glossy. So you get this the gloss on the smooth part and the, the, the dull finish down in the, the woven pattern. How did you apply that on the, on the top surface then? You know, the, uh, the same kind of dry brush. I okay. dab the brush and just lightly go over it and not purposely not go deep, just lightly touch it. Yeah. And the whole thing was gesso and the nice, gesso is a nice, um, it gives a nice texture that really grabs paint. So even when you go lightly, it, it'll grab the paint wherever it touches. Cool. But you were, I, uh... I've never been trained in painting. I've figured all this out on my own in the last 10 years. When you're using the India ink, is it is it full strength? You just, you just pour it out? <laughs> yeah, I bought that pint bottle of it. I mean, the pint bottle was something, $8 maybe. And I just smear it on. And the, ni the nice thing about the India ink is that it leaves no texture at all. It, it, it's more of a dye than, in, than a, it's not a, like a paint. It's more, of, it's like a black dye. Yeah, I can't believe you were using that without gloves. That <laughs> stuff gets all over the place. And it, um, yeah, but it washes off. <laughs> it comes off pretty easily. So it penetrates like a dye as opposed to a surface paint. It soaks in, yeah, it, it soaks in pretty rapidly. Does it raise the grain? Um, probably. Um, I guess what you're doing doesn't the texture doesn't matter. The, the texture, I mean, the texture is sort of the what the goal. So right. if it raises it, it's it's usually a good thing, not a bad thing. Right. It'll it'll really highlight grain if you uh, put it on, and then do a very light sanding. It really stays in, you know, the 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 deep in the grain. Right. All right, any other questions? Very well done, Lars. Thank you. Yeah, great presentation. It was wonderful. Yeah, Lars, yeah, no, it's, and as, as Ted and Mars both mentioned, doing these remote demos is actually way more work than doing a live demonstration. The, the, the whole video process um, to do a 60 minute video probably is, I don't know, 10 times that that amount of work to, to get those 60 minutes, I know, because we've done a couple. And uh, it doesn't and it, feel like it when you start, but by the time you're done, oh, yeah. <laughs> when you, get, you get tired of looking at the same stuff over and over again. Oh. When, I, when I discovered the, the fast forward tool, I just went crazy. <laughs> um, the one advantage of doing this remotely with video is that um, I would not be allowed to burn those flames at the NC State Craft Center. Oh, we would have set off sprinklers, alarms, given John <laughs> a heart attack. Or yeah. even I, I w when I was at the Albuquerque um, National Convention, whenever that was, 2014 maybe, um, they didn't even want the people to bring the, the butane canisters into the hotel. They right. not, don't light them, but don't, don't even bring them in. And so they were giving them away. They were out front on the sidewalk. <laughs> Can I ask you one question, Lars? The blackness of your pieces, how often is the blackness the pure burning and how often do you use the paint that's the blackness? Um, with most finishes, the, the finish, even when it, even if the wood is kind of light, the finish will tend to make it black very, very black anyway. Um, one, one thing I remembered that I did, um, I, I, this is a cedar ball and it is not black. Um, and the finish on this is just the, the Beale buffing wheel and the wax. Mm -hmm. So putting, putting the carnauba wax on it um, does not make it go black. 
And the same thing, this was um, the piece I made in Trent Bosch's class. And um, I went crazy grinding away and carving away. And then I started burning it and um, just had a grand time with this. And I painted the inside gold. You can't really tell. I the outside is just a blank burning. It's not a paint. A burning and then it has beeswax on it. Mm -hmm. Just hand rub beeswax. Mm -hmm. Looks That's great. Excellent, Lawrence. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. That's a lot good. of lot of positive comments in the chat, Lars, uh, on the presentation. Okay. I, very good job, and thank you so much. Yes. For all